Greetings, Princeps, and welcome to the 49th episode of the Gun Engine Cast, a podcast dedicated to discussing the Adeptus Titanicus war game produced by Games Workshop. In this week's show, we are going to be discussing the changes to the game since the release of the Loyalist book. This is not going to be a review of the Loyalist book, as I'm still waiting for my copy. The Games Workshop have very nicely put out a adjusted FAQ listing all the major changes, so we're going to dig through that today and see what they've done to the game. Before I get on to the main section of the show, let me just ask for help as usual. The usual social blurb that goes before every bit of social media these days. Please rate and review the show. Please subscribe to my Patreon and maybe even buy me a coffee on my Ko-Fi account. All the links for these things can be found in the show notes. Everyone who subscribed to my Patreon account, you have my uttermost thanks. You are helping me push forward plans I've got for this podcast. And yeah, we'll move on with the rest of the show. So let's address the elephant in the room. It has been two weeks since I last recorded. Yeah, um, I didn't plan this. I had hoped to do a full series on the Legio Solaria by now. But when I was researching the first episode, The Deep Dive, I realised that a lot of new material was going to be coming out in the Loyalist book. And then when the information started coming out that they were actually changing the rules of the Legio Solaria, I put the brakes on the entire project. I've rescheduled my interview I was going to do for the Legio review. And I'm going to pick the whole thing up next week and we're going to start work on it again. So for the next two episodes, we'll be looking at content from the new Loyalist book. And then I'm going to turn to the Legia Solaria, and then we're going to have, have this two-week gap, which is fine, because it's given me a bit of a break. And I've been pretty productive in that break. As anyone who's been on Facebook, my God Engine page, or the, my Instagram account, will have seen a lot of new Titans being built. All my Titans for my Legio Volcanum were delivered, or most of them anyway, and I've been throwing them together. I've been really going to town with adding some unusual upgrades to them. I'm building them so they are a mid-heresy force. Um, the Dark Mechanicum have started adapting the Titans. We aren't seeing the rise of actual corruption yet. There's no sort of biological tentacle arms or anything. But yeah, their weaponry is becoming distinctly non-standard. Um, please check these pictures out. Tell me what you think on them. I'm looking for feedback. Um, the project's still got a long way to go and I'm hoping to get them on the table by the end of the summer, but we'll see where that ends up. But that does bring me to the other topic of things I wanted to talk about today. You see, other than building these Titans and the Titans arriving, the other big parcel I got in the mail was a small box from England containing a pile of bits from the Battle Bling store. The chaps behind the Battle Bling store contacted me as the host of the Gun Engine cast, wanting me to review their product. Uh, I said I would be very interested in doing so, and they sent me this box with a selection of their wares in it. So I went through and started looking at them and started using them in this Volcanum force to give me a sense of how they actually exist in the game space. Also, I'm not as concerned about having my Volcanum force being purely Games Workshop legal product because I have my Incarnum I can play at Games Workshop stores. Um, I think that's a debate for the future. I've got feelings on third-party parts and how Games Workshop handles them and their place in the greater market. But let's not get distracted here. Let's talk about the actual BattleBling stuff. So yeah, BattleBling sent me a small selection of the different upgrade kits they do for Titanicus. Um, Overall, I have to say the quality of these little bits are incredible. I showed a few of them to one of my friends the other day, and he was really impressed by the 3D printing. Um, I'm don't have a great experience with 3D printing, so I wanted someone else to see it who does. And they were very impressed by the lack of sort of support scarring, which is apparently a thing in many 3D printed parts. The resin they use is of a really high quality. I was very impressed by how it bonded with superglue. My experience with resin and superglue is lukewarm. Um, I think everyone knows the problems with Games Workshop Finecast. And I actually find that superglue on Finecast models it takes a long time to set, and it can be very awkward holding the models in just the right place to get the bond. The same in many ways with Forge World resin. The resin on the sword alternative arm that they sent me went together really well with Super Glue. In fact, it bonded so quickly, I got the pose slightly out of what I wanted it to be. Um, if I was doing it again, I would get it 
re- I would redo how I was doing it because I didn't expect the bonding time. Uh, I expect I had a bit more playing time with it. But that's a good thing because you want to be able to put these models down fairly quickly and move on to the next piece. Um, it's just something to be prepared for. I really, really love their little uh, Reaver Titan magnet arm upgrades. I've spoken at length about my dislike of magnetizing Titans, especially the Reaver and Warhound. They're just very fiddly to do. There's a lot of cutting and trimming and actual green stuff in places to get the magnets to sit right. And in general, the work involved makes Titans that look a little rough, and I'd just rather buy another Reaver Titan. Well, having these two upgrade arms for has allowed me to actually magnetize my titans for my Vulcanum. Uh, both the titans that have uh, close combat weapons glued onto them, which is a variety of reasons, um, have a arm stub now to allow me to swap out their alternative weapon, uh, which is really nice. It gives me a wide selection and a lot more utility out of my titans. And for effectively five dollars, or I think it's about going to be about five pound, um, probably just under five pound, you can get a set of upgrade kit yourself for Reaver Titans, which will allow you to do up to three Titans, which is probably all the Reavers in most forces. Now there are several bits they sent me that I probably won't find a use for. Obviously this was a sort of blind gift bag of random upgrade kits, and some of them just don't mesh the aesthetic that I want to see in Titanicus. So I'm not going to really talk about that side of things. They have a wide variety of selection on their Etsy store, so you know if you're interested in something, I would say think about buying it. They're all relatively cheap, quality of the product is very high and you'll you know get what you pay for now i have to say the biggest thing about the battle bling store for me is the fact they do really cheap nameplates now there are many places that make nameplates out there but the price actual per plate is fairly high i actually found the battle bling price was fairly low uh, which for me is a big consideration as i do end up watching my pennies a fair bit of time so i put in a rather large order a couple of days ago for nameplates for all my titans and when they arrive i will review that product as well because um yeah i'm very excited about getting that so a huge thanks for the chaps over at battle bling for sending me this stuff and photos of all this stuff can be found on my instagram page i'm gonna be uploading other bits and bobs here reviewing the other bits and products i reckon i'm gonna put a few stories up talking about the individual pieces here in the next few days and weeks so if you want to look for something to make your titans unique and you're playing an environment that allows you to use third-party bits i encourage you to take a look at the battle bling store their material is really good and i think it's pretty good but as i said i'm not usually one who goes for these third-party bits so i daren't to compare them to their competitors which i know there are plenty out there so with all that said let's go get on to talk about the faq and the changes to the game as a whole that the new Loyalist book brings with it. So that brings us nicely to talk about the main topic of today's show, and that is the FAQ and Arata Volume 1.2, the edition they put out after they released the Loyalist book, for those folk who are listening to this in the future. This FAQ came out the Monday after the Loyalist book was went live and you could buy it from the stores. And it covered basically all of the changes that they put into the Loyalist book, updating the text and all the other currently published material. Especially, you know, the rule book, which was also released on its own the same day. That book was coming out with material that was different from the Loyalist book. This FAQ clears up any misunderstanding and clearly states that the material in that Loyalist book is the correct interpretation of the rules, if there is a difference. It does also include a little bit of errata for the Loyalist book itself. We'll cover that when we cover my review of the Loyalist book, and my thoughts about day one FAQs will crop up there as well. Overall, let's just say I'm a fan of day one FAQs. I don't think it shows any sign that Games Workshop aren't adequately proofreading or checking their material. There are always going to be mistakes, and at least they fix the mistakes fairly quickly these days. Though with a few clear clear uh, exceptions which I'm sure we will get to today but I want to sort of address the big big unanswered question with this FAQ is that it doesn't answer all our frequently asked questions in fact over the last year I have sent Games Workshop numerous questions to in particular problems and many of them haven't been solved um, for the most part this book just 
make sure that all of the other books have been FAQ'd to say, yes, the Loyalist book is correct. And that's about it. It also means that if you collect a Legio and you do not want to buy the Loyalist book, but there are good reasons to buy it, you don't have to anymore, which is a good thing. I wish they kind of dropped this FAQ last week. It would have given us a bit something to preview for what was coming out with the Loyalist book, but it probably would have hampered some people buying the product. So there's that. So with all that said, let's go and look at the things they changed. Hint, it's mostly going to be stratagems, but away we go. Okay, the first point that's changed in the FAQ is the sabotage stratagem. Basically, this has been changed really subtly. Normally, if you pick an enemy titan to sabotage, you take the order dice, you re-roll it. And if, for some reason, the order you rolled could not be given to that titan, you get to re-roll the dice again. Until, uh, presumably, you get an order that you could give the titan. That step is now removed, and if you roll an order that cannot be given to the titan, the order is just discarded, and the titan has no orders. So this stratagem becomes pretty useful about for just removing an order from an enemy titan. And you still have a 1 in 6 chance of shutting down an enemy titan, which is rather nice. The next stratagem to get alterations is the Thermal Mines. And they've done some really interesting things with the Thermal Mines stratagem. The Thermal Mines stratagem had always been, in my mind, one of the best stratagems out there. A good way to deliver a pile of strength 10 hits to your enemy titan's legs. They've toned down the strength of the hits to strength 8, which is still kind of scary, but not as bad as strength 10. Additionally, they've also set it so that they don't automatically go off. You play the stratagem when the enemy finish unit finishes moving. You roll a d6. On a roll of a 2 or more, d3 strength 8 hits hit the enemy titan's legs. On a roll of a 1, nothing happens, but the stratagem is not discarded, and you can play it again. So it means that, you know, there's always a chance the stratagem's not going to work precisely that turn. It also clears up the language to make it pretty clear that it can be used on a Night Banner. I mean, a pile of strength 8 hits to a Night Banner is still really good, but it's not like the strength 10 hits to a Night Banner that would just wipe you Night units out, which was also really, really good. Overall, I really like these changes of Thermal Mines. It's brought them down a couple of notches in power, which is really good. They needed to be toned down. They're now pretty good for two stratagem points, but not overpowered. And I wouldn't feel bad about throwing them in my list. In fact, they probably will start appearing more in my lists again. So the next up is the Voidbreaker field. Um, they've just done a bit of clarification here. It still works basically the same. You play the Voidbreaker shield when an enemy type with active voids finishes moving. And you roll a d6. And the result of that dies is the number of hits they take to their shields. If you roll a 1, nothing happens, and you get to keep the strategy for future turns. Previously, it was unclear about whether you would inflict a single hit, and then you could use it again in the future. They've just now clearly stated that nothing happens. Which is a nice bit of uh, clarification. It's how I presumed it worked, but I know people like to see it in writing. Next up in the FAQ are the new rules for the Legio Graphonicus which I know will make my friend Andy very happy, as they've clarified a lot of stuff and made Graphonicus, I think, a much better Legio. And I'm looking forward to going back and re-reviewing them for a main episode of the podcast. First of all, the Lust for Glory trait has been clarified to point out that only Legio Graphonicus Titans can break the Honor Jewel declared by other Legio Graphonicus Titans. So if you are being really sneaky and running two mana pools with two different Legios, that other Legio is free to shoot at whatever it wants, and it doesn't mess up the honor jewels of the Legio Graphonicus Titans. I will point out that this means that a Legio Graphonicus Warmaster dropped into any other Loyalist Legio list becomes immensely scary, as it singles out an enemy Titan for utter annihilation. Other than that, they cleared up the language quite a bit for the Lust for Glory special rule, turning it from more of a Age of Sigmar version 1, talking about, you know, decries and declarations to a much more clear, defined, rulish text, which is a positive change in my opinion. The second point of change is with Mainstay of the Titan Legion, their second Legio trait. Basically, this is the simplest change and also probably the most profound. They now can replace any Warlord or Warhound Titan with a Reaver Titan, whether mandatory or compulsory. That is fantastic. Uh, Graphonicus have become the Reaver Titan Legio. Uh, they always were intended to be so, and now they are. There are some fantastic things you can now do with Legio Graphonicus. I'm particularly 
keen on the idea of a all Reaver Extermagus, or perhaps even all Reaver Ferox for a pile of Reavers getting in close and causing all sorts of mischief. Then they have allowed the uh, war gear options, the motive subreactors, and the gravitas plating to be fitted to all Reavers within a Graphonicus battle group, though you have to pick one or the other. Uh, the plating is now, it still remains at 20 points. Um, and it does basically what it did before, though it doesn't quite protect the legs as good as it used to. And the motive subreactors have stayed the same. Overall, these are some powerful changes to the Legio Graphonicus. Like I said, I can think of a pile of lists now that run on all Reaver list, mixed in with some heavier plated ones, some quicker ones with the subreactors pushing up the table and causing a lot of damage. Um, I really like the idea of just having three or four within a Ferox, or even, as I said, an Extermagus, and then supported with a couple of other Titans from other Legios or a lot of Knights. I think this sort of list has the potential to be a pretty powerful force on the battlefield, and I look forward to seeing it on the table. Now we actually move into the frequently asked questions part of the document uh, for the main rulebook. Now this stuff obviously isn't in the Loyalist book, so this is changes brought to bear to the community through the FAQ document itself. The first question they've answered is, can you make targeted attacks with weapons such as the Questorus Knight's Meltagun or Acastus's Knight's Autocannon? Never thought that was a real question, I had never considered making a targeted attack, and the answer is no. Which is nice and simple, and uh, means that in the future we get an idea that, you know, if you get something that auto-generates hits, those auto-generated hits cannot be targeted. And I think that's a fundamental rule that's one of those things that will shape the game going forward, especially as we see other iterations of rules with very similar styles and mechanics. It gives TOs and event organizers a pretty solid idea of the intent of the rules. So the next question talks about how the Voidbreaker trait works. They basically ask, does the Voidbreaker trait work like it said in the Warhammer Community article? And the answer is no, you get it once per weapon attack. It clearly states that if you had a group of knights firing, they would only count as having made one attack. So you'd just apply the Void Breaker trait once for that entire attack, which is how I thought it worked and how I talked about it previously when I talked about Volkite weaponry. Then there is a question about painting. This comes up a lot in Games Workshop's FAQs of late. A lot of questions of like, can I play Ultramarines if my Space Marines are painted like Space, Mar space Wolves? And, you know, Games Workshop's response is, you no, know, but yes, but whatever your opponent thinks. And that's exactly the answer they give us to the question, if I paint my Titans in the colours of a Titan Legion that has published rules, do I have to use those Titan Legion's rules when I play games? Or can I choose use, to use a different set of Titan Legion rules? And again, they give the answer that is, really, we're going to expect that you're going to use the Titan rules that make sense to you and your opponent. Providing you and your opponent understand what's going on, do whatever you want. But it's all about communication, and it's all about making sure everyone knows what rules are being played with. And they finish the sentence by saying, What really matters is having fun, creating memories, and if they want, shouting engine kill! And that is exactly my thoughts on nearly anything Titanicus related. At no point does any of this really matter if we're not having fun and we're not enhancing our lives with this game. It does mine, it doesn't matter how bad a game I'm having, I'm still enjoying the game, and it's one of the wonders of it. And I'm going off piece here a little bit, so let's raid it back in and get back to the FAQ. And by that I mean to return to Games Workshop's waffling on how Void Shields work. Once again we get a re-clarification on how squadroning and Void Shields work, and it confuses me somewhat. Moiging Virgils has been a source of many questions since the game started. The mechanic itself is a little bit rough, even though it's narratively fantastic. And once again, they've produced a three or four, three paragraph explanation on how it works and how you have to declare which title is taking the hits, working out things like and, um, shields to full. I'm not going to read through the entire paragraph, but the important takeaway is they clarified that you make that declaration per it exchange between titans. So for example, I have two warhounds in a pack facing off against a reaver. 
But soon, when that Reaver declares that it is attacking the Warhound, a Warhound in that squadron, and it is going to shoot at them, that you declare which of the two Warhounds is facing the shields, and which one is going to shield values are going to be taken for the saves, and that works for all of the incoming attacks from every single weapon that Reaver carries. I've seen some people complain about it already, or not complain, but state that it does make their squadroning weaker. I really need to drill down more into it and perhaps reach out to those people individually and see if I can get an idea of what their thoughts are on it. Um, for me, it seems like a pretty simplification and shouldn't really change gameplay a huge amount. But I'm probably missing something because I don't share my shields and my titans a huge amount. Um, and when I do, it's only for an attack here or there. So it's what it is. It may start changing substantially when I start playing my Legio of Volcanum. Um, and that's going to be it for the core rulebook changes. Next up are the Erratas for Titan Death, which we will get into now. Okay, so the Titan Death Errata is rather interesting. It's only focused on changes to the Titan Legios um, and the Loyalist Legios at that, obviously. And I'll quickly work through the list of these Legios and sort of talk about what I think their changes mean for the particular Titan Legio, especially the Legios that I've covered before. The Warp Runners have a very subtle change. It allows their veteran Princeps rule to work on the War Master, as it now can operate on Titan scale 10 or higher, meaning that a Warp Runner's War Master is re-rolling two dice uh, for its repair actions, which is quite frankly scary. Legio Defensor have had some very subtle changes, really cleaning up the language of their, of their Legio. They've clarified that the additional shot that Legio Graphonicus Titans get to make can only occur in the combat phase. They've cleared up that um, the Devotional War Sirens only work on friendly Legio Defense or Titans in the rare case you're playing a mirror match. They've lowered the cost of the stratagem and cleaned up the language completely on the other stratagem. It works basically the same, it just is a lot clearer now in how it works. Which is all pretty good. I like the Legio Defense or they're a Legio I want to cover at some point. And I think this actually makes them a much more user-friendly Legio to use. There's a lot less worrying about exactly what the rules say. So overall, pretty good changes. So then we get to the Firebrands. The Firebrands are a really fun Legio who I kind of dismissed as being pretty weak back in the day. I think they've gone a long way to fix that in this errata. First of all, the seizing the initiative trait has changed. It used to be that you could re-roll the dice in the first turn to see if you could go first. I felt this wasn't usually very good because you want to go first when you're in engaging in combat actions and the first turn generally you want it's all about movement and in those cases you want to go second you want to see where the opponent's going to move before you move your titans that's been changed now seizing the initiative can occur in any turn which may need, means near the end of the game when you need to start going first to get those first fires off to destroy the enemy titan before they have a chance to repair you can do it now and that's really good Secondly, they've upgraded the Infernus Missile Launchers. It used to be that the Infernus Missile Launchers just caused, like, fire to occur on the battlefield, which caused low-level damage to enemy titans and destroy terrain a bit better. They still do all that, but they also now come with the Void Breaker 2 trait, the same as Volkite weaponry. And that's really good. You apply it to any Apocalypse Missile Launcher in the game, making all Apocalypse Missile Launchers long-range Volkite. And that's really, really fun. Um, putting it on the Warmaster, because it can be upgraded with them, uh, allows the Warmaster to tote some really long-range Volkite weaponry that really gives it some good shield-stripping power that was something it was kind of lacking. So, uh, Legio, Atrocious, um, Warmaster is a lot more self-sufficient than everyone else. And at the end of the game, it's going to be going first. And that's just a little bit rude, if I'm being honest. So, yeah. Finally, we have the Legio Solaria, who've had some minor changes. They've had a lot of changes, but a lot of it is pretty minor. First of all, their wolf packs can now go up to five, rather than the bonus to go to four, which is kind of useful. Squadroning five for Warhounds has a place, especially if you're running the Lubricol Manipole. Uh, I'll talk about the mechanics of those um, packs a lot more in an episode when I talk about Legio Solaria, and me and Lucas kind of already covered it in the last episode. Additionally, they've clarified how the Fortis motivators work. Well, they've just changed the mechanics to make it a little more durable to other changes to the repair phase, basically. It used to be that when you rolled dice in the repair phase, any dice could be used to repair a uh, critical damage to the leg, regardless of what you rolled. They've now said you can 
repair critical damage to a legs on a 1 plus instead of a 5 plus to give you a little bit of variance in case someone throws some penalties at you in the repair phase. They changed how chameleon shrouding works, and we'll talk about that more in the Legis Larry episode. It's still a really good upgrade. Basically, it means they're harder to hit when they're further away. And finally, the biggest change, and the change that's going to really redo how I'm thinking about playing the Legio Solaria is the stratagem Fog of War has been allowed to be taken multiple times. Fog of War allows you to redeploy Warhounds. This is really, really useful. But there are a lot of controls because you only can redeploy Warhounds if you have a larger Titan as well. So it's you've got to be building a list to use this stratagem, and it's, now you can take it multiple times. It really changes the way Legio Solaria lists build. So we'll talk about that a lot more next episode, or the episode I do my deep dive into the Legio. And finally, for the Titan Death reviews, they've changed the Lupercal Light Maniple. It's a very subtle change. They've removed the ability to add the additional plus one strength when forming packs. So a pack now only does plus one damage for a coordinated strike rather than Lupercal's bonus of plus two. This is really good, and I'm so glad they've done this, because the Lupercal Maniple having that plus two strength for being in a pack meant that it was basically a little excurmagus and I mean you heard Lucas talk about that last week in the last episode he was very keen on this mana pool because of that plus two damage I was always focused on the ability to repack up and have the flexibility there and it remains that and it's why the loop is still going to be a really powerful mana pool but it isn't perhaps the most powerful mana pool in the game anymore or maybe it's just balanced I don't know but that's what it is so that's the Changes to the Titan Death book. The next book they go on to deal with, they talk about some stuff in the FAQ for Titan Death, but they haven't changed anything from previous. They've just gone straight on to write some errata for the Legios within the Doom of Moloch. So we'll talk about that next. They move to the Doom of Moloch erratas. These are going to be Legio and Stratagem changes. The first Legio with a change is Legio Crucius, whose bifold power containment system has dropped, which I think is a really good thing. I think I talked about that in the Legio Crucius episode, that the bifold power containment was a really nice upgrade, but a little pricey at 30 points. Bringing it down to 20 probably means most Legio, Legio Crucius players are going to have a long, hard think about taking it. Especially on the larger Titans. I'm very much thinking the Warmaster in this case, who's take, spending an additional 20 points to be able to offset reactor issues is probably a good thing. But also, it's not going to be a problem if things go badly with the containment system. Legio Fortidus is next upon the block, and they've had some interesting changes as well. First of all, their Lost Sons ability that allows them to drop other Titans into mana poles basically has been rewritten to make sure it doesn't apply to the Warmaster, or actually any Titan larger than a Warlord, keeping themselves future-proofed there for future Titans. A very solid change. No one wants to start throwing... Warmasters into Corsair Manipals. They've also had a little bit of clarification on their personal traits. One, basically clearing up the language, and the other one, limiting you to only gaining plus one stratagem point for that particular personal trait. Theoretically, if you were to take multiple princeps with the Soldier of the Crusade as personal trait, you could have got multiple additional stratagem points. So they've reined that back in, which I think is a good thing. It's not something I've really thought about before, but I'm glad to see their mitigating some potential abuses of rules. Overall, these changes are pretty minor for the Dauntlesses. I'm still really happy with this Legio. I think they're a particularly strong Legio, and one I think many players get some really good fun playing. Their capacity to switch around Titans means they're pretty good at just being a good collector's Titanicus force. You can pick up any Titans you really want and come up with some fun and innovative ways to play them. Um... As me and Lucas were talking last episode, the way we sort of collect Titanicus is we buy Titans and then sit down and sort of, we've got a full buffet options of all these manifolds we can put together. And you aren't quite as hemmed in as you would be, say, with 40k. 40k, you quite often collect to a single list. And unless your collection grows crazily big, you know, like you suddenly start getting four or 5,000 points worth of models, you don't have a huge amount of variation in your collection. You're always going to be taking roughly the same sort of list. That's really not the case with Titanicus because you've got the options to switch them out with the mana pools and you don't have that many. There aren't that many options for units, but there are many ways you can combine them. You can get a pretty large Titanicus force, get about 
10, well, not 10 Titans, but if you get to six Titans, you open up most of the manacles to the game that you can play. And um, the Dauntless even open that even wider, giving you yet more options and variability, allowing you to play with more of the rules for less financially financial commitment. That's the word I was looking for there. So then we move to the stratagems, and they made some fun alterations. The first one is they've altered Dawn Attack, changing the distance you can see from being a D6 times 10 to D6 plus 1 times 5. Now, this only applies for the first turn of the game, but I think it's it's become really good. Dawn Attack used to be one I used to take because I wanted to have a bit of fun with it. Um, but you roll a D6, and you roll a 6, you're seeing 60 inches, and, you know, that doesn't matter. Uh, if you roll a 6 now, you're only going to see 35 inches, which is not long range on all your weapons. Uh, it does push Titans to closer together. Um, you can't lob Volcano Cannon shots from one side of the battlefield to the other anymore. Uh, so it really has a place. Definitely think that has made this strategy worth taking. It's still a three-pointer, but that first turn, it does mean that if you're going to run a Legio that's virtually going to go all ahead full, so you aren't going to be firing and thus giving your positions away, it gives you quite a bit of flexibility to move into positions that otherwise wouldn't afford you as much cover. Basically, if you keep 36 inches away from the enemy Titans, they aren't going to be able to target you, so you can put Titans well out in the open and do pretty hard flanks that first turn. So yeah, definitely has a place. Um, you need to be thinking about it way in advance, but it's now an option and now a strategy I would take more than just, you know, wanting to do it because it's thematic and fun. Next up is the Vox Blackout. Now you've heard me and many others in many other podcasts and YouTube channels rant about the Vox Blackout and all the problems it brings. Well, they've increased the cost of it to three points, which I think's worth it now. It definitely, it definitely hurts the Vox Blackout. It's still going to be problematic with how it handles opponents' stratagems, though. Although it doesn't actually mention stopping stratagems in the Vox Blackout card, uh, so I've already seen several interpretations out there on the internet saying, oh, they've removed that problem, they've removed the Vox Gotcha. The problem is they haven't. They actually haven't changed that part of the rule at all. What Vox Blackout always has done is when it is played, the strategy phase ends. So if you are first player and you play that as your first stratagem, your opponent gets to play no stratagems. If you are the second player, the you limit your opponent to only being able to play one stratagem. So if you throw that down in the first strategy phase, it means the enemy won't be able to play many of the cards in his hand for play this in the first turn, which is a problem if you filled your hand up with cards that are like your entire strategy, your entire stratagem budget went to those first term stratagems. So I think, as I was talking about last time I spoke about the Fox Gotcha problem, all the same solutions the TOs were needing to consider still applies. I think if a stratagem is an upgrade card, it should be played when you place battlefield assets. Spending a stratagem point on increasing the upgrade or of a titan, you know, experimental motivators, experimental weaponry, should be placed at the same point that you're placing battlefield assets on the board during the deployment phase. It lets the opponents know what you're, they're facing as you say it, as, as your titans go down, and they can't be blocked by the box blackout. I think it balances out in a nice way, and is pretty nice and simple. But that is just my house rule, and I'll leave it to others to decide what they are going to do. You could also still maintain a ban on Vox Blackout, even though I think moving the cost to three points makes it a sizable ask for most players. Then we move to a series of stratagems that they just cleaned up the language on. Wages of Betrayal, Martian Servity Clades both have had just a little bit of grammatical change to make it a little clearer what they were intending with these stratagems. Quake Shells and Haywire Barrages have been limited to once per game, both which are good. The Endurance of Terror stratagem has changed the rules around to make it a little clearer how it works. Uh, mechanically, for anything but a Warmaster, it works exactly the same. Um, for a Warmaster, it, yeah, it's a bit different, but that's good. It makes the stratagem actually useful for a Warmaster, I think. Drafting Run has had its strength increased, which is really good. Um, it is also now uh, one use. Um, but going to strength 6 means you really can lay some hurt on if you've taken out the enemy shields. Speaking of which, Static Rain has become really good. I mean, I know a lot of people were talking about the fact that the uh, Strafing Run used to be their go-to shield stripping weapon. Well, I think Static Rain now falls into that option. Static Rain is a 3-point stratagem that used to be 
you put a point down and then any Titan within 2d6 of that point took d3 um, void shield saves. It's now a 12 inch radius. It's always going to be maximum radius. So you're putting a 12 inch sphere, so 24 inches, where you're just going to hit the enemies for d3 void shield saves. But the real kicker here is it also stops knights taking any ion shield save. You drop this in the middle of a knight household and you've stopped the nice household having any ion shields. Suddenly, those medium strength weapons that you always talk about being great for killing knights, really do. Uh, you can rip through Questorus knights with those strength 8, strength 7 weapons with impunity, because you're going to be able to get the shots and the damage to bring them down. Now, it's a little tricky to play, so you've got to make sure you aren't going to be within 12 inches of where the rain comes down, so you aren't taking void shield hits yourself. But I think that's workable where the strategy phase fits in the remainder of the game. Yeah, it's a really, really powerful ability, and um, I think it's become well worth three stratagem points it is. Finally, Earthshaker Mines have the same treatment as Thermal Mines, meaning that they don't always go off, which I think is really good. Um, it gives the chance that the mines don't work as a real underscore that it's not a guaranteed strategy. You can't guarantee that you're going to be able to hit someone in the legs and then finish them off with a void, um, with a vortex missile, which is good. Um, it complicates the game and doesn't mean there are sort of auto-win strategies out there. Overall, these changes for the Duo Molex stratagems are really good. They fine-tune every stratagem. They bring the power levels down on the powerful ones. They bring the weaker ones up a couple of notches. That said, I still don't think they fix a Vox Blackout correctly, but that's just me. And I don't like Vox Blackout as a stratagem. It stops, and it stops your opponent from doing things. And that's always going to come across as a problematic thing in any game. And other than that, that's everything for the Doom of Molech. Uh, they didn't really fit anything in an FAQ section. It was all previous, the asked questions, no new questions were asked, which is a shame as there are several questions I've had about content from this book, especially about the night households that have yet to be addressed. I'm hoping they'll come in the future. Maybe we'll get really lucky and the book after the traitor book will be a night household book pushing all the night rules and rewriting it all out again. Because that would be really, really useful, and I think the game's crying out for it. Especially maybe it's a way they could fix the Acastus, and, you know, the tyranny of the murder turtle can finally end. So then we move to Shadow and Iron, where they haven't actually done anything to the Legios found within this book. Which is a really nice change, because the Legios in this book were pretty good anyway, so no rebal rebalancing has been done. But they have gone and fixed some of the new weapon traits they introduced into the game, namely Impale and Shock. The changes to Impale are really good, and they actually make the Ursus Claws kind of useful again. Or kind of useful for the first time. Um, it used to be that to do anything to an enemy Titan, you had to at least match the Titan's scale. So if your big pack of Warhounds weren't able to match the scale of the Titan they were firing at, nothing happened. Your Ursus Claws all caused damage to your own Titans. Which is why I went down the road when I reviewed Legion Ordax and said, hey, I don't think the Ursus Claw is really any good. Now, if you, providing you do not roll a 1 on your Impale dice, the enemy Titan is moved. 45 degrees to the left or to the right. Sorry, 90 degrees to the left or right. Which is crazy amounts of movement. Um, this is more than just one move for some of those slower titans. A warhound walking up to a warlord and impaling it virtually guarantees that providing it hits, you are going to be turning that warlord out of arc away from you if you're at the front and turning your turning the titan to the flank for the rest of your addition other weapon to fire upon, which is really good actually. Um, it makes a case that you can just run a single Ursus Claw on a warhound and expects some good results. Uh, it really messes up enemies' plans. Um, a single Warhound first firing now really messes up the enemies' plans. If you're just going to turn them 90 degrees, now they're facing something they can't move through. You could turn them and face a building, and they won't have the movement to turn around. They're going to push their reactor to turn. Yeah, it's really solid. Um, an absolute hassle. It's going to be like blowing the weapons off enemy titans, which everyone's talked about being a sneaky and horrible strategy um, and this really opens up the options 
Um, you aren't going to be taking out enemy titans regularly with it anymore. Uh, you, I mean, it's still as likely as ever. The math really doesn't favour you taking out warlords. With warhounds, you've got to run really big packs, and I just don't think it's possible. But weapons with the impale trait will now cause the enemy a lot of headaches, which I think is kind of the point, and I really like that. In the same vein, they've made shock a little better. Shock's another fun rule that really wasn't that useful to shut down an enemy titan with a weapon with a shock trait you needed to actually penetrate them and then roll a four plus or more they've now made it so you have to cause damage to the enemy titan on the, and then you get to roll a dice and a roll of a three plus they shut down or if you just cause superficial damage a roll of a six plus shuts them down which means on the really big titans a shark lance has a one in six chance of shutting them down if you hit which may not seem like much but a shutdown order does take away all the enemy shields and that's really, really useful, and there will be a time it comes into play, and it makes the shock weapon pretty scary for any enemy. I cannot overstate how happy I am with these changes. In fact, I've really changed my opinion on the Ursus Claw now. Uh, I've got a Warhound group I'm putting together for my Legion of Volcanum, and I was going to put a shock lance on one of them. Um, and even though the shock lance has got better, I now really think it's probably going to be an Ursus Claw. I know it's only going to be strength 3, so, you know, I'm not going to be able to bring down any Titans of scale 10 or greater. But I'm going to be a really, really annoying person. Uh, it will run up and start moving you all around most of the time. And that's got to be worth something. I mean, I'm thinking of pairing it up with a um, Vulcan Megabolter. As I think it will be really useful to take out enemy shields. And then once you've moved, I better then shoot the Vulcan Megabolter on your flank, getting all the additional bonuses, especially if another Titan's opened you up. Uh, it's going to be a pretty good combination. I think it's going to work real well. And yeah, it's made me excited for the Ursus Claw which is really good, because I've been pretty down on them for most of the time they've existed. Okay, so the other big change they made is to a few uh, stratagems, with both the Concealment Barrage and Tracer Cloud getting the same treatment. Their uses have now been limited to the strategy phase, and you can only use them once per game. This is really good, it means you can't just suddenly throw one down in the start of another phase, and it means they can be stopped by the Vox Blackout, which is a good thing, because both these stratagems are pretty powerful, and yeah, it's a nice balancing act. So that's all good. And that's the sort of errata for the um, Shadow and Iron. So move to the FAQ. The only frequently asked question from the Shadow and Iron book is a question about how this sabotage stratagem interacts with the Psy Titans. It's pretty simple, really. The sabotage order will take away any psychic power that that Psy Titan has, as it's represented by an order dice. You re-roll the dice and anything but a shutdown order is ignored. I really like this solution, though I do have a worry that perhaps now sabotage can be taken as a good way just to nullify out the Psy Titan's power for a turn. I've already talked about how the Psy Titan really relies on those psychic powers, and being able to sabotage it and not be able to, it, be able to do its thing in a turn is particularly really powerful. So, yeah. Um... It's cool and also something to watch out for, especially if you're playing an opponent and you're looking for a friendlier game. Maybe leave the sabotage stratagem at home. So the final two books, Defense of Riser and Crucible of Retribution, get a brief errata in FAQ. Though nothing substantial changes in either of those books. I think the two large take-home items on this are first the Vanguard Fighters rule for the custom legios. They really clarify how it works. There had been some confusion in the past about who gets the bonuses for what. And it's pretty well clarified now that it's always the scale 7 or lower titans get the bonus, and you get the plus 1 to hit, regardless of whether you're in 6 inches of an enemy titan or not, which is all really kind of nice. The Legio Ignatum strategy, Guard the Gates, has been clarified that the first fire order can only be used without a command check in the first turn with this stratagem, which does limit its utility. And I go back to the conversations I had about Legio Ignatum, and yeah, I'm not overly excited about this stratagem. Um, I didn't think it was very good at the time, and this just reinforces that it's not really great for the rest of the Legio. Other than this, the rest of the changes are minor punctuation changes to make sure the rule works as intended. Um, for example, the Legio Honorum Titans, uh, the Basileus Thrones, are just clarified that it doesn't matter how many princeps you have on the table with the upgrade. Um, it's all pretty stuff like that. It, it's good stuff, and I'm glad they've done it, but it's generally not going to impact games hugely, and it's not going to change the way many games are being played. 
Finally, there are some erratas for the Loyalist Legion book, which we will cover when we talk about the Loyalist Legion book when it finally arrives. They have added a new sort of special rule to the Acastus Banner card, which states a back group can include a maximum of one Auxiliary Knight Banner per mana pool as reinforcements. A Knight Household can include a maximum of one Auxiliary Knight Banner per Lance as reinforcements. No Knight Banner with a Lance other than the Seneschal's Banner may be an Auxiliary Knight Banner. This is really interesting. This is basically the rule as per the last FAQ, but they have once again let you take a, a Castus Manipal as a Seneschal in a Knight Battle Group, a Knight Household. I'm very mixed on this. I know a lot of people were against it because the Seneschal gets to do a lot of re-rolls. They can re-roll to hit and all sorts of stuff. But to be honest, you're going to be paying a bit of a tax to do this. And I know you don't on paper because there's no actual point cost being a putting a Seneschal into a Knight. But a Knight a Seneschal has to operate within a banner uh, or a, a Lance, which means they've got to have two other banners attached to that Seneschal. So to take the Acastus that are going to be re-rolling to well, re-rolling ones, which is fairly powerful, you're going to need to take at least two of the units, probably Questorus Knights. You can take in units of one or two. Um, probably you could take a Mechanicum Questorus Knight. Uh, they come in real small banners, if I remember rightly. But they aren't cheap. I think the cheapest still is the Questorus in the groups of three. So you're looking at, like, maybe you can get away with under 300 points to support that pair of Acastus with re-rolling ones. And then you'd be limiting them have to stay within six inches of that Acastus. So I mean, you got a bodyguard, but to be honest, the amount of firepower I'm throwing down wind at the Acastus like that, I mean, static rain, uh, just for one, uh, it's going to hit the entire lance anyway. So they're going to go down just as easily as any Acastus and tie up more of your points for just being able to re-roll some ones to hit, um, which is really good, but I just don't think it's actually worth the points. Um, I'd much rather spend the time making sure all of my lances were... Serastus banners with them charging up the table towards the enemy titans a lot quicker um, with the Acastus banner working in support lobbing shots downfield. I still think that's the optimal way to put a knight battle group together and uh, I don't think just allowing the Acastus to be central really changes that. Um, yeah. And there we have it, the current FAQ version 1.2. I'm rather happy with this document, I'm glad they put it out, and I'm looking forward to the next one when the traitor book drops. I hope that at this point they will take a moment to address some of the other issues that remain unanswered, and perhaps now is a good time for you to submit that rules question you had to the FAQ team there at Games Workshop, so maybe they can sneak it into the version 1.3. Taking a step back, I think many of these changes they've implemented have become are because of the Loyalist book, not just because of the FAQ. And I love the direction they're taking the game. They fix some of the fundamental problems with things like the Ursus Claw, and many of the Loyalist Legions have been tidied up, so I think the power curve between the Legios have been dramatically reduced. I've talked before about trying to come up with like sort of power rankings of the different Legios, and I really think the Loyalist book has messed that up. A lot of the weaker Legios have been brought up, and some of the stronger Legions have been knocked back down a few pegs. I'm really happy with the changes they made to the stratagems as well, balancing the stratagems out in a rather useful way. I still think we're facing a lot of stratagem bloat, and I've got some ideas of how perhaps the community can help deal with that, especially for newer players who may be intimidated by the 70-something options we have now for stratagems. But that is another project that I just need to find a bit of time to conduct. It's one of those things, I start having all these ideas and not really having any time to get some of them into motion. I'm not quite sure where April has gone at this point. And that, with that, we shall bring the show to a close. The next show shall focus on the Loyalist Legio book. Whenever it arrives, I shall start putting the show together and it'll get out to you as soon as I can. In the meantime, continue to follow me on Facebook, on Instagram, occasionally on Twitter. I will post updates about my work on my Legio Volcanum and the additional events I'm starting to think about running this year. It looks like there could be a narrative event in Oklahoma City slash Norman in the midsummer, uh, looking like July 24th, possibly. Uh, if you're interested in that and you live in the USA, message me and we'll see what I'm going to be doing. 
And additionally, if you've got any events going on in the next few weeks, let me know and we'll talk about them on the show. I'm very interested to hear war stories as the games around the globe start up. And now we are in the waning days of this pandemic. Everything willing. So with that, I shall all wish you a very good week. And till next time, be well and have some good fortune. Thank you again for listening to another episode of the God Engine Cast, a podcast dedicated to discussing the Adeptus Titanicus game produced by Games Workshop. This show was written, recorded, and edited by Martin Emery. This podcast is completely unofficial and no way endorsed by Games Workshop Limited. No challenge to any trademarks or copyrights are intended. All rights are reserved by their respective owners. If you have questions for the show, please email me at god.engine.cast at gmail.com or reach out to me through Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, where I am the God Engine Cast. Until next time, I wish you all well and good fortune.